All right, so, um, so last week, what we did, or last uh, time we came back um, to the course, um, you have to read this, and this, 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 this is for my notes. Um, it's just script. It's just script, yeah. yeah. My script, and I also have a bit of uh, kind of equations and stuff. Um, so last week, what we did, um, we went and we kind of talked about um, correlations, convolutions, all this kind of stuff. We talked about um, putting it all into a model. We made some simulations as well. We can actually simulate your own stochastic DCM, which is quite cool. And uh, after that, we kind of at the end we touched on what cross-spectral DCM was very, very quickly and how it all comes together. And I think from that point, I think I rushed it really, really quickly just because I wanted to get it all out and just say the word cross-spectral DCM. Um, so today we're actually going to go through and go through some data that Linden gave us um, and apply it to a DCM and show you some results and how it looks like. And you'll see that clicking all the stuff we will do at the end will take like maybe two minutes. So the amount of five hours the last course in the amounts to like two minutes of clicking in this toolbox. So it's, um, yeah. It shows you how much um, kind of mathematics there is behind it as well. Um, so I'm going to go through again about the Fourier transform. And I'm just going to go through a little bit more slowly some parts. Um, and uh, so I'm going to apply this and show you um, an application to the frog mosquito problem. I'm going to do that properly because we did it very quickly last time. I think I confused some people. I'm talking about the uh, Fourier convolution theorem. It's a very important theorem that's actually important to cross spectral DCM. And I think important to, I think in general, uh, any type of signal analysis that you do, if you have EG or fMRI or MEG, that kind of stuff. And then at the end, talk about what a cross spectral density is or a cross spectrum is in general. Um, all right, cool. Good, good, good. So last week, we kind of got acquainted with the Fourier transform. As I said before last week, it's a, it's a way to transform your data. So F, as you'll see, you're here. And you multiply and have this, this transformation here. And that transforms your data in this sort of time space function signal space into a uh, spectral space. Okay, so this Fourier transform, each component of the Fourier transform terms of the weighting of, of different frequencies. So you can think of it in that, in that respect. Um, so one thing I'll say as well, with this Fourier transform, you see I have this f of omega equals this, but we actually calculate it into uh, MATLAB, this is actually a complex number. Um, so I just want to ask how many people know what a complex number is? One or two. Okay, so this is something that actually comes up in, in actual DCM um, and actually comes up in the results. So I just want to go through what it actually is. So this is another way of the like uh, kind of spreading mathematics far and wide. So um, one thing you can think of uh, is as the I'm not going to say that it's not the square root of minus one. That's not I'm not sure exactly what it is. So a complex number is a number where you have a real component, real number, okay, plus an imaginary number. Okay. So this, this is just kind of extends uh, kind of uh, all numbers into this extra additional space, like a different dimension, so to speak. Um, so what are these things actually? What are, why are they useful? So if you consider something like, if you had this equation, x squared equals minus 1. Okay, if, if hold on. let's start with on the right, okay? On the right. So. If you wanted to find the x values that equals that when you square it equals four, what you do you can say x is equal to put it to my calculator it's the square root of four equals two. Does this makes sense for everyone, sort of stuff. But of course, it's also it's not just plus two. If you also square minus two, that also equals four. Okay, you just put it to your calculator. So therefore, x is equal to plus or minus 2. Okay? Yeah? Now, if you have x squared equals to minus 4, instead of minus here, 
if, if you want to look into your calculator, what is this? You get an error. Because this, this number does not actually exist. Okay? So what an imaginary number is, is a way to actually get around this trick. So what you actually do is invent. So you call, you call the square, I, I, the imaginary number I, I squared, give it to minus one. So it's a way to have a definition for this. Okay? So the solution to this equation actually equals x is equal to plus or minus 2i, where you just call the squared bit of i uh, equals minus 1. Oh, actually, yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, this is a lot of really deep mathematics from making this definition. But essentially, what you do, like I'll say, you extend all your numbers to have these properties. You have a real number, or what do you think to have an imaginary number? Most numbers in, in, that you deal with in the world don't have any imaginary components. They do come in when you, you introduce this in this unique sort of framework. And this all might look quite weird, like why the hell would you want to do this at all? It's because in systems, um, when you're doing this solution, it turns out using this has very nice properties, very, very interesting properties. And that's, that's as much as you have to know about these complex numbers for this DCM stuff. So if you type this into MATLAB, FFT, but you do a pass through trans through transform into MATLAB, and you do any signal, you'll see you see it will have an imaginary component and the real component. Okay? So both of these two make up the actual signal. Okay, they make up everything in the signal. And if you want to do if you if you do a Fourier transform and want to recover it, do the inverse Fourier transform, and you need both the imaginary and real parts together. That's just something that in terms of if you do it in your, in your calculations, you'll see this, this interesting thing. I mean, you can look up complex numbers in Wikipedia and all sort of stuff, get like another uh, general idea of what it actually is. And there's a really kind of weird and interesting mathematics in there. Okay, so that's just on complex numbers. I just want to give you that because it will, talk, it will come up at the end when we're actually doing the, uh, the DCM. Okay. So, as I said, it's a complex number, so if you want to get a power spectrum out of it, what you do is, so if you have a Fourier transform, to get a power, so the power equals the Fourier transform and times its complex conjugate. Now, what a complex conjugate is, so F conjugate equals the real part of f minus the imaginary part part of it. So it flips this sign around. So for instance, if you have f, if that equals to 1 plus one i, the conjugate of this, if you give them that star, just equals one minus i. Now, if you're a bit lost by this, I mean, I, I can understand this is like, you know, this is sort of without, you know, quite the deep mathematics. Um, but these are just things you have to. These are just law, laws that are used, and we don't have to go into too deeply what they all, all mean, this kind of stuff. Um, so when you look at a power strip in a paper, you see, okay, we have a a spectrum of frequencies, all this kind of stuff. You have this, you have to equal to, this is how you get the power spectrum. You take the Fourier transform times its complex conjugate. And that is equivalent to doing this, which is taking the absolute value of each of these and squaring it. Okay? So I think for the purposes here, all you have to know, think about in MATLAB speak, because I don't want to go too far into this because we can go too crazy. F, that, that, that term there, in MATLAB it's essentially just apps of it. Okay. Um, 
what that does is actually takes the square parts of these two and adds them together. But that's just uh, an aside at that point. So that, this is how you get the power spectrum. So you, you do a Fourier transform, you see it's complex, take the absolute value, like here, and you square it. And it gives you that stuff you see in papers all the time, the power spectrum. Like I said before, I'll reiterate, the imaginary part of these complex numbers just extends numbers into this extra, extra dimension. And it helps with a lot of mathematics. You can actually do all this stuff without that, but it makes it much easier with this. Okay, so we did that last week, and I explained a little bit more about this. Um, and then last week, I also said another really amazing part of the uh, of the Fourier transform is you can change a lot of your differential equations to something much nicer, to algebraic equations. Okay, and I went there very quickly, and I think I scared a lot of people. It was like, what is this T? What is this? What is going on? So I want to go through and show you what this all means very slowly. Um, that's kind of all that we'll need on, on this extra free transform stuff. Okay. Now, in the first lecture, we kind of went through and we kind of uh, solved something numerically. Uh, solved a system numerically, the frog and mosquito system. Okay, and we solved it on a computer, you for homework, and you kind of still have all look like. Okay, now, this is the different way of solving this equation. So, first off, so let's go back to that system. dy dx equal to. Okay, so this here, yeah, everyone should know what this is. It's denoting uh, the mosquito population as y, and the, sorry, that's t, and the frog population as x. Okay. Now, by uh, a theorem, okay, which which I said last week as uh, last time as well, that we what happens when you take a Fourier transform of a differential equation? These are all just laws that we're not going to derive, but just just take them as for granted for now. I think. So, if you have the 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 x dt, you take the Fourier transform. Let's just move to the next Fourier transform. That comes to I omega and X. Okay, this is just it's just a, a rule. Okay, and if you also take the free transform of dy dt, it's the same thing. Y omega. Okay, this is just this is just rules we have here. I'm going to apply them here. And by doing this, at the end of this, we will actually get an analytic formula of how to derive the power spectrum for this frog mosquito system. And this is the heart of cross spectral DTM. Needs all this, all this formulation. It's the same exact thing. Okay. So now we're gonna, what we're going to do? We're going to apply these things here. We're going to take the Fourier transform on the left hand side, Fourier transform on the right hand side of both equations. Okay. Let's put it in again. We, we, like I said, we started this last week, but let's let's go what it all means. Okay. The first one, I'm going to use that rule and put it in. Okay. That ten side, I'll take the first transform of that equals i omega y omega. The right hand side equals to minus zero point one. Taking the Fourier transform of x, and that just means this. I don't know what it is, I'm just gonna I'm just taking the Fourier transform of it. I'm gonna apply it to y and u. So minus 0.5 y of omega plus u of omega. Okay. This it tells you this becomes an imaginary component in front of the Fourier transform. Again, we've extended numbers into this uh, extra dimension, that's what has happened. So let's go to the bottom one here. It's i omega x of omega equals y omega. As I said before, all we've done is just put this up, 
put these rules in and had this uh, had this sort of rule put together. This one equation here is equation two. This is equation one. So if I wasn't in one yet, is this fine? Okay. Cool. All right. And let's go all the way. All the way. Next step. All right. So. For this one here, I can make x the subject, this is just an algebra, x of omega equals y of omega divided by i omega. It's just maths, algebra, sorry. It's rearranging equations. Okay. Now we're going to do this. We're going to sub, substitute 3 into 1. Okay, so we end up with the following. We end up with i omega y of omega equals minus 0 0.1. Again, like I just want to reiterate, we're just following rules right now. Minus 0 0.5 y of omega plus Okay? Just putting stuff in. Putting stuff in. That's all I'm doing. So next thing from this, I'm going to get more algebra. This is uh, very exciting. I can tell from the excitement in the room. Uh, you'll see why it's exciting. I mean, I, I get excited too. Maybe dread. This is, most of my PhD was doing this. Parting pain, maybe, on my PhD. So, what I've done here, I've moved all these terms to the left hand side. Okay? Just more, more maps, more maps. Okay, that's good, that's good. So now, y of omega, I have this here, and to make that the subject, okay, I'm going to take all this and divide both terms by this. So that, if I divide all terms by this factor, that's going to be equal to 1, and that's just going to go to this side as a numerator. Yep, algebra again. 1 divided by i omega plus 0 0.1 divided by i omega plus 0.5 makes a lot of noise and that is the what we sort of ended up with last week when I went there really quickly and just called it today. So, what does this mean? Okay, I'm gonna read, like we're going to do this last, but I'll say it again. If we wanted to know the frequency characteristics of the system, okay, that's why we want to know how the mosquitoes, uh, what the dynamics are, and we know the dynamics of the input. So this is before we had a Gaussian. We can make a, a sine wave. We can do anything we want. Okay. To get the dynamics of the mosquitoes, all you have to do is get the Fourier transform of your input and times that by this function, and that's your solution. So I don't have to do any differential equations. I don't have to solve anything in terms of like an ODE solve, which you have in that, which is present in the code. And calculating the Fourier transform or something takes, you know, milliseconds. So if you have a stochastic DE, it's a very long, long time point, all this kind of stuff. I mean, this happens in a, a fraction of the time. You efficiently solve this, this problem. So well, like, like we said before, like we showed actually, that in the first few lectures, that this mosquito frog DCM, uh, this mosquito frog system can be written up as a DCM. 
So DCMs can be written like this. It's the same formula. Okay. Yep, does anyone have any questions on this? So as well, I mean, this could also be noisy. So this can also simulate noise too. And that, this, this, is, this is why I, I really, really love Fourier triangles. You can do a crazy amount of shortcuts, okay? And it's, it's only valid for linear systems as well. And as I said before, most systems are linear. Like most of the properties of the very interesting things are linear. Now, what people normally do in this system is they call this, this coefficient here, they call it the transfer function. They also call this T of, and I'll call it from uh, 2y from u of omega, u of omega. That there is a transfer function. They call it the transfer function. So if you know this transfer function, you can determine always the outputs. Okay? And people people have done this many, many years for all the different systems, like earthquake systems, for any type of engineering type responses. And what you can actually do as well is not even calculate this analytically. People do this experimentally as well. So you can see here, if I rearrange this equation, what the transfer function is actually saying uh, of you is the ratio of y of omega divided by u of omega. So you, could, you can go ahead and get data and you can actually calculate this yourself purely from data, not from any type of math as well. So this is a fundamental property of signal, signal analysis as well. But we derived it analytically. With, the, with our bare hands, we derive this analytically. It's all, it's all good now, okay? Makes more sense? Yes. Yeah. Good. This, is the tra the, this word transfer function is in the DCM. If you, when we do it, you can actually see the transfer functions of each region. And for this one here, as I said before, I'm, I, I called a specific way. I said the transfer function from u to y, okay? Or to y from u. And this transfers, or transfer function, the frequency content of u to y in a specific way. Okay? Transfer function. So please stop me now if you don't understand this because this, this would be, this is in, in spectral DCM. So the harder of all of the stuff as well. No? Okay. Good. All right, nice. So, some of you can see there is homework. <laughs> so, in that flow system we had ages ago, we had a coupled system between uh, the vasodilatory signal and the flow. So what I want you to do for the homework is do the same thing before that, that system. So remember, the Fourier transform of a constant function is, you don't have to worry about it, it's just like like 0.5 times the, you know, just put in front of the, the variable. So you have to have s of omega and f of omega and z of omega. So what you want to do for homework is calculate t of 2f from z. Please ask me if you, you can't do this. Because um, it's a bit tricky. It might, might be a bit tricky. You might forget some of these parts, but we can go through it together if you want to. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. 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 Um, I also say yeah. So with this one here, so this thing can be just noise. Can be white noise, pink noise, brown noise, any other noise. And all I want to do is have a very transform of that. Is the, the power of it. Okay, that's a very important part we have to go over. So I'm glad we did. 
So now I'm going to go through the steps on the next building blocks. Um, so last week we talk, we kind of introduced the convolution, what a convolution was, and we reintroduced to some people. Let's remember who all familiar with this again? Yep, it's okay. It, it, it's the the output is you take a, a function, then you take an input function, kind of response, and the convolution of those two means you're kind of building blocks. You have the response to one thing and you have this accumulation of these things acting together. Yep, it all seems familiar. I mean, one thing you can kind of look at is this one here. That's very hard to see there, I'm sorry. But, so this here is an input, okay? And here's our convolution kernel. A little Gaussian there. And if you convolve this with this, you end up with this noise signal here. Yeah? And something we saw before, we can see that this is much less noisy than this. It's almost like it we're fil filtering, right? It looks like it's filtering the signal. Because what it's actually doing is saying any, any of the response in this short time window is aggregated together, and for each time we have that kind of net smooth response. So now what we see is that, of course, th this thing is smoothed by this, so what happens if we change this? Let's make this thinner. So if I make this thinner, this, 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 this convolution kernel, you'll see that this becomes more noisy, right? So this is, a, in effect, like filtering at a different level, okay? You might have done this in your own work. I guess Marnie probably doing all this stuff with your EEG, EEG stuff. And it's all behind in the work that's happening. This is convolution. I have a question. Yeah. It's like it's the second function is all zero except the very small time window, which is like a delta function, but like yeah. not, not completely. Yeah. So when you have that time from zero to hundred mm -hmm. and non-zero value in a small window, of like around. 10 or 5 or whatever, yeah. how it actually, like, is it moving somehow or how it actually captures the whole thing from 0 to 100 if it's non zero only in this moment? Good point. So, actually, what it's doing is actually it's sliding the window. Mm. So, this function here, this, this tall function there, is actually sliding that a little convolution kernel along. So, it's like a little bit of this, capture all of this. And give me output. And this next part, capture all of that, give me an output, and it slides along. There's a very nice animation on Wikipedia if you want to go what, by convolution. It's a good point, actually. So that's what's happening. So, one thing you will see is that these two, it looks like when you change this, it changes this pattern. And it looks like it's filtering, right? It's a filtering thing. And there's a reason why it I'm using the word filtering. Why it looks like it's filtering the signal, getting rid of high frequencies. There is a reason why it all works together. And it's this, the Fourier convolution theorem. This is a super huge, super crazy powerful theorem. Okay. This says the conv the Fourier transform of the convolution. So the frequency content of the convolution output, it equals the product of the Fourier transform of the first input and the Fourier transform of the second one. So, if I got a picture. So here, uh, what I've done here, okay, I've taken this one here, and this is the Fourier, this is the Fourier transform of Z, of the first one. This is the Fourier transform of that little Gaussian dip. And this here is the Fourier transform of the convolution. So to get that out for free, all you do is calculate these separately and you times them together. So, what, so when we use the word filtering, it's very specific here because you take all your input frequencies and then you times it by this, therefore it's shrinking things down. It's suppressing, so you can see here the high frequencies, all is suppressed. And suppressing all of those, you can leave it with a fruit trend that looks like this. That's why it's also called filtering. Convolutions, 
filtering for a trental, they're all kind of part of the same thing in a different dialect. Okay? That's this for a convolution theory, I guess. So again, um, we use the word we spoke about last time, how the bold response is normally called a low pass filter of neural activity. So this is where it comes from. If you take the Fourier transform of the neural signal, take the Fourier transform of the bold response, generic response function, it has, a, it has this character, character. And the result is the product of the Fourier transform of the HRF of the neural drive equals an output. Okay? That's what this Fourier convolution theorem means. And if I go back to here, does this star? Yes, that's right. What so, again, so this is al almost the product exactly. It's this little star thing, and that means a complex conjugate. So that trick I said before, where we take the um, the real imaginary parts, that's what's happening there. Okay. But you can do this yourself. So, what you can do, you take the Take a signal Z, do F F T, and then in MATLAB, you take G, F F T, and then you take the free transform of that and you square it. Remember that's the power spectrum, the free transform squared, the absolute value squared. Yep. Yeah. That equals Z squared G. So uh, here I've actually plotted both the Fourier transform of the output and, and that thing as well. You can see that you can't see differences in the like, right hand side of it. Exactly, exactly on top of each other. This is a very powerful theorem that's used a lot in signal processing. The Fourier convolution theorem. Allowed, allowed to do things much, much simpler. Okay? Cool. Alright. So now, with this, so I said this is equivalent, right? To doing all this stuff. Um, so in the frog system, okay, remember in that frog system we had that transfer function T of this thing, T of to y from u of omega equals something. Remember that? Yeah. That's in Fourier space the transfer function. If I take the inverse Fourier transform, okay, it gives you that the kernel. Okay? So you can even you can say this thing. You can calculate y of omega is equal to t of y u of omega times what we had before, or y of t equals t y of u in time convolved with u of t. It's the same thing because of this convolu convolution theorem. So what that so what that looks like in time for our frog mosquito system is this. That's our convolution kernel. But in Fourier space, it looks like that. So you take whatever input you can, and you modulate it by this function, it gives it the output frequency spectrum. This is the app. So the, the NISP will be useful not, not in, even for modeling, but just for signal properties' sake. Uh, if you're dealing with any kind of if you do more EEG or MEG kind of analysis, you come across this a lot. Because signals are very complicated and you need, you need a summary of these signals, you can take this, this for a transform approach. Cool. Okay, is that, does anyone have any questions for that, this part here? No? Or happy? Happy somewhat? Um, okay. All right. So we have gone through Fourier transforms, convolutions, um, last bits 
the last last bits we need is uh, this cross spec cross spectrum. What it actually means. So they're all related together in some way. Okay. So in last last one as well, we also talked about how to relate two signals together. In resting state, you normally take a parsed region of the brain, and then you do the following. You say, okay. I'm going to take a past station that I choose from. Let's say I choose A Park in, um, in Free Surfer. Okay. I have this sort of thing. It's a really bad brain. Maybe it's a monkey or something. What does it look like? What kind of brain is this? Is it so bad to draw it again? Yeah, all right, fair enough. Is that still bad? No, I don't know. Okay, so if you have signals like this, there's no task, right? The common thing everyone does in this functional heuristic, function region literature, is to take the correlation between these two. Okay, and that gives you a sense because you can't do any task-based uh, deterministic DCM because there's no task. And every time so these things are driven by its ongoing activity, which changes the dynamics of the system. We went through that as well the last few lectures as well. Okay, so the way you relate these two together, you do a correlation. Yeah, everyone agrees with that? You guys should be, I mean, a lot of us in the lab do this. Okay, so in our previous, oh, hold on. And let, that's an example of this in action. Um, so, I have a, an oscillator network. I have something like this. Okay, I have a signal this way. Let's say call it region A, it looks like that. Region B looks like this here. Okay. It looks, it looks very similar, okay, it looks very, very similar. Yep, just to make sure you agree with me. And so we, we saw in our frog mosquito system, you have, you have this oscillation network, okay? And you, you know that, that they're related together because we actually put relations between the two. Okay, there's an oscill the oscillations that are actually apparent in this system, okay? So I'll, I know for a fact that these two are related because they look very similar. And there, the, the dynamics in our system says you should have oscillations like this. So if we, if we saw this in data and then apply a correlation to this, what is the correlation between these two? So correlations again, to remind you, well, they go from 0 to 1. 0 means they're uncorrelated, 1 means they are correlated exactly. Can, someone, can people tell me what they think the correlation between these two is? You say it's close? To minus one. To minus one. Anyone else? Is it easy? You say it's minus one? I've got one, I've got one value. Oops. Okay. Minus one. What else people say? Minus point of five. Minus point of five. <laughs> any more, any more. Come on, any more answers. What do, you, what do you all think? What do you think directly is true? What do you think? Minus point. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. I'm minus one. Minus one. You said that. Minus what do you think? I don't think it's that anti-correlated. Uh, I'm yeah. going to say point three four. Point three four. Yeah. And what do you think? Oh. Sorry, negative point three four. No, I think they're anti-correlated, just not so strongly. Yeah. So you can guess. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll solve it from there. I'll just that. Okay, so we, what do you think you say? I don't know. <laughs> New correlations, right? Like, that's that one there, that's that one there. Can you see the same thing, it just like, as you can see, it sort of starts at a different point. Yeah. And it, it's an oscillatory system, they're connected for sure, and they're related to each other. Okay, so, we have all these values. <laughs> What is the answer? Should we just take the average and see if the wisdom of the crowd gets you? <laughs> Zero. 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 This shows you the weakness of a correlation when you have oscillations. Okay? It's zero. So if you did this in data, you'd be like, they're not related to each other, they're not speaking to each other. I'm on threshold amount in my data. Zero. Okay? That's because correlations do this. They plot x and y, 
as you can see, it's a circle. The best, best, best fitting line is a straight line and zero. They're not correlated. So if you have ongoing activity, ongoing oscillations, um, and you want to model this, correlation might not be the best thing to do. If they're phase lagged by a complete cycle, okay, it's likely you're not going to get any correlations. Um, if these are very closely correlated, so in, in the brain, sometimes you can have these correlated quite closely because the measurement you take is every two seconds and the transmission speed is in the order of you know, milliseconds. So you're not going to get this exactly in the brain for fMRI. So don't be worried if you, if you think about this in MRI. If you think about EEG kind of stuff, you might get this. You might get this. Kimmy, could you please show the, the plots? The yeah, that's two again. Explain why this is zero from here. So the reason why is if so this thing is actually I've plotted sine mm -hmm. and I've plotted cos. Sorry, that one's cos and that one's sine. And because they're out of phase by a complete cycle, yeah. So the next the next one actually starts or like or maybe this one starts first. The next one is like a cycle off or half a cycle off, yeah. Okay. So you can, you can do this yourself, and you can do this your core, 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 wave, core plot in MATLAB, and you'll see this. So it's the it's dangers of just using correlation for this other system. Um, so, and I think we should say, the reason why this is all important for, let's say, from Ryan to DCM, is that correlation is a static measure, you want something that's dynamic. Okay. So if I took this data, that one there, and if I shifted it, okay, because they're, they're exactly the same signal, I'll tell you, they just shifted. If I shifted them, you'd have a correlation of one, or something really, really high close to one. And so this is what the idea of this thing here, cross-correlation, okay, or cross-covariance, actually, this one is. What this does here, it takes us two signals, and it shifts it and finds a correlation at each time shift. Okay. So the, the, the difference is just one phase here. Or? This here goes um, as many phases as you want. Oh no, the difference between those two yeah. is just one phase. One phase. Okay. It's linear. Yeah. They're linearly um, different. It's half a phase, right? Yeah, half a phase. Yeah, a uh, half a cycle. Yeah. Half a cycle. So uh, it, it's a it's a an exa a contrived example that they normally show, and when they teach this stuff. Okay. So what this is? This is a cost covariance one. And this is what's in DC and what, what they actually do. Is this cost covariance. Okay. If I pressure between two signals. And so if I did that for the following problem up here above, this is how it actually looks like. So you have zero at, at delay zero, tau equals zero, and half a cycle off, you have close to one here, which is what I expected. And as you go further on, you have almost close to one. The reason is that the signal isn't actually there anymore. So that integral actually goes, gets smaller and smaller. So this can give you a much better signature of dynamics between two regions. Cross -cor correlation is not enough. You need this here. Okay? So cross, -cor cross covariance. And cross correlation is actually just this that's normalized by a certain value. Okay, good. That's all we need. We need to have a measure like this. But to do this, you can see here, it's all in signal space, right? So to actually get that out, you have to simulate the whole entire data. The go hand and actually you can't do this any any kind of any quick tricks, you have to simulate the entire data, which is quite annoying, right? Because I showed the power spectrum had before, it doesn't work here. But you can make it work. So I'm not going to derive these things. But what it says here is that the cross covariance between two signals equals the convolution of the first signal times the minus in there and the second signal. So you can use this is similar to a, um, a correlation. Uh, Another word, uh, convolution. There we are. 
So you can, as a theorem, is that not too hard to prove if you know the integrals, but you can write it in this way. So now that we have a convolution, what can we use? If we have a convolution, what can we do? What can we use? A theorem that we had earlier today. I don't know, you kind of said it. What do you say? Convolution theorem? That's it, the Fourier convolution theorem. That's it. Because I have a convolution, what I can do instead, if I take the Fourier transform of this, i.e., if I take the Fourier transform of this, okay, I know it's like a convolution, and I could just use the convolution theorem. And that cross correlation gives you is, is this, okay? Cross correlation of f and g is the Fourier transform of the first signal multiplied by the complex conjugate of the Fourier transform of the second signal. These are all standard things in MATLAB you can do. All standard things you can do. Okay? So this gives you the, yeah, so the, the cross correlate, cross covariance in frequency space. And this is called the cross spectrum. This is the cross spectrum between f and g. So this gives you the information of this, this sort of frequency and the frequency space of the of this signature that we had before. Okay, and this is this is what the ACM calculates between two regions. Now there's a reason why this f and g, this is directed. Okay, this is from g to f. Alright? If you had from F to G, this will be start instead. So it's directed. It says it's very important which way you have the multiplication. So you cannot put different variables in just one equation, yeah? For example, if you have A, B, C, F, G. Yeah. So you should just do it with uh, every single pair, yeah? That's right, exactly right. Good point, good point. So, as I'm going to get that on there. So if I do this, if I had two regions here, what that what you actually get from there, you know how I have that connection pair like that, we had the connection being something, whatever, whatever it is, you can also get a um, cross spectral density between you know Two R one from two, and you have it in frequency. So we have the signatures between these two. Oops, that's the wrong way around. Like that. You have the signatures of how these two are correlated to one another in frequency space. That's what a cross spectrum is. So this gives you more information. Just correlation gives you much more information. So the reason why I wanted to do this is because you can have a model which has very high correlation, but of course, obviously, before, you can have cases where um, you know, it gives you something that doesn't make sense. Okay? And this is what, what um, DC must do. Now, we had everything in Fourier space. We have this function here. Okay? Remember we said before, once we put everything in Fourier space, all, complete, all these things can be calculated and... and Essentially, when you do all this stuff, this can be calculated analytically. Okay, you can actually put in a formula, which gives something, and you put the input in. Which is why, I think we did it before, last, last time, is that before, you take a long time to simulate all this, okay? Whereas now, it's very, you do the Fourier transform, and you put all this stuff together. And um, the estimation of the parameters happens in seconds in front of our eyes, which we'll do um, right now, okay? So before we get into that, there's this big figure. Who's seen this in the in the? Yeah, you all seen that. So can I go smaller? No. So this is what we actually did all of this now. So that part they don't worry about it because um, this is a different way of representing data, which we don't really care about. We care about all this side. Okay, we have our models. So we have our models up here, our state space models. 
all these should be less scary now. Yeah? Yes. Good. We can represent things as convolutions, so we can actually solve the system and have a convolution kernel uh, with our inputs. Or we can write it in a Fourier space as multiplication. We can then calculate things such as the cross covariance, which we did today. We can also calculate a cross spectral density um, using, using the same theorems we had today. Okay, and from that you can determine a cross correlation, it's just, it's just this but normalized, and coherence, another thing which I didn't mention, but it's another thing called coherence, is just normalized by something. So we have all the stuff here which is in that paper, okay, on this side. So DCM works with all this side. All that side are different kind of estimation models, like Wendy causality and other AR, autoregressive models and things like that. Okay, so let me just reiterate everything we did in this thing here. Fourier transform gets dynamics to the frequency space. Yep. We can use transfer functions and get to solve the system to go to transfer the frequency content from A to B. The cross spectrum details the dependencies between two regions in a dynamic setting. It's not static, it's a dynamic kind of story for what's happening between these two regions. And it's just a signature of these, of these uh, pairings. They have real imaginary components, which we talked about today, for this, this sort of complex conjugate. So a DCM tries to fit the real component and tries to fit the imaginary component. It's just two parts of that it's present in there, so as to remember. Okay? And these two give rise to how things are lagged and how things are related to each other in this dynamic setting. So the cool thing about this, it tries to fit a lot of the data, not just something simple, a lot of the data all together. Okay, so do we have any questions from that now? Yes. What's the, like, so how then you interpret the, like, you know, just in, like, an illustrative sense, the actual dependency then between the two signals? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, like, is it, how is it, you know, frequency content in one region, what is it doing to the other region? And, like, so as, as um, that relationship increases or decreases, what is the interpretation of that? Yeah, I mean, um, so the Lacoste spectrum tells you that I guess in, in the sense of the uh, the frequencies, I guess that the two things are correlated to one another. That's that's the interrogation it gives you, and the strength of this dependency at different frequencies. So I mean, think of also that at these two regions at certain frequencies, they're not really correlated to one another. So you might think of like a beta rhythm, not correlated to like an alpha rhythm, so to speak. Well, they're not really, but they kind of are correlated. But you can think of two things that have different different rhythms. Um, and the strength of that comes at different uh, frequency values in the cross spectrum. So if two things were exactly, you know, the same signal, you'd expect this cross spectral density to be uniform on all frequencies. But of course, there are some cases where certain frequencies they um, interact with each other. So you can consider something like, you know, like region two is that one, and region one is the case here. Okay, so with these two, you'd expect the, in the cross spectrum you have this higher relationship between these two at only one kind of one or two type of scales. So these large scales and any scale that overlaps with that. So this high frequency information is not present here at all. So you won't have any of that strength in the high frequencies between these two. But then how, how is that relationship directed? Say that the low frequency content in the right, in fact, you're just saying that they're both, that low frequency content is in both signals. Yeah. But then how right. are you saying, like, how do you interpret, like, because you can get two parameters out of that, right? Like A to B and B to A. So yeah. what's, what's the interpretation of that direction, I guess? Like, I know my question's a bit opaque, but like. Yeah, no, 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 you're exactly right. It's hard to tell of direction of these things. I mean, it's, it's more, I guess. It, this direction is quite uh, obvious in EEG, so we have an actual shift in time. Um, but you might have subtle shifts in time when you might have this and another region which is shifted as well. So I can tell you this time lag like, is present in the signature too. 
and that time lag will also be, pre will be present in the cross spectral um, signature. And that will come up with the imaginary component, actually. So I guess all that information is there, actually. It just gets, takes time to unravel this. Yeah. And to be honest, I'm not an expert in cross spectral density and spectrum, so um, yeah, I'll try to find out more than <laughs> that. Uh, but it's, uh, I guess, the, yeah, it's I'm another just, way of looking at this. Yeah, I'm just trying to decipher, like, when you read in a DCM paper and someone says, you know, this region had increased directed connectivity from A to B in this group, or yeah. you know, just trying to reconcile that kind of lay scientist interpretation for, a, like, a difference or a, you yeah. know, a, a unidirectional versus a bidirectional connection in group A versus group B and how that kind of fits in here. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, where they pull that interpretation from. It's quite hard because it's all done in this sort of automatic setting, but like directionality, you can have this with the model, but in terms of causality as well, like pure signal causality, it's very hard and bold. Mm -hmm. And you, have, you can only do it by uh, kind of what model fits best. Mm -hmm. That's what bold, that's what DCM does. It's all, it's all present in the neural model too, actually. So you can do it with the cost factor density of the neural populations, which give rise to things that look like this. Um, but you're right, it's actually quite quite difficult. I mean, it's, it's very obvious in EEG. In bold, not so much. Um, so there's a, you know, like anything on this right-hand side, you see the word gradient causality. Um, and that's quite a red flag for the women with fMRI. I don't believe that this is actually a valid measure for fMRI at all. I see people like, you know, GDAT and composite and stuff using this in bold. But it's actually quite hard to do that. Um, yeah, I've, I've read this stuff that can great. Yeah, well, it's, it's actually yeah, quite a quite an interesting thing. But yeah, I mean, so you have some. I guess the main point is that you have this method that's better than correlation. And this, if there's anything there, there's a signature present in the CSD. So if um, if there's like a strong effective connectivity directed into regions, yeah, do you think that will also be reflected somewhat in other kind of measures of connectivity, like functional? When it's not directed, but if there's a strong connectivity here, would you get a stronger functional or even like ETI using other measures? Or not necessarily? Well, I mean, that's, the hope is that, yeah, that, that it will be present in other, it will be present like in anatomy. Yeah. There was that paper that um, Adil sent us all, which had that yeah, local imaging where they could target nodes. Yeah. It was really, really cool. But I mean, there's no guarantee. Mm. I mean, this is just a generative model. Yes. And this is the best. You have a model space, we made a model space, a linear system, all that kind of stuff. And the best evidence from the fitting of the data gives you this. Mm. And that's, that's why it's very hard. You should never say that we found the effective connectivity is this because mm. it's, it's always under the premise of being in a model. Yeah. This is the, the key thing. I mean, if you have something like a Granger causality between two regions, you can say that. We say that causally, the, the, the granular collateral use between area one and two is this. Um, but it's always within a framework of... of, of but it's actually quite hard because mm. the, the key thing is, as well is, which is sort of in the background of all this, which is the reason why the brain is so hard, is that if you had this, right, this connection here, this is just, just one, it's our simple model. But a very, it's very plausible to have this these indirect connections. Mm. So it's very specific DCM what to try. They just feel given the right evidence, ignore your evidence. So you can do whatever you can with, with the data. So it's, it's an important important point, actually, very important point. Um, and if you see the attacks on DCM, you can't talk about this stuff as well. Mm. Um, but the always the argument from DCM is given in this model space. Cool. All right. Let's go. We have last few minutes, and I'll show you how how fast this will all take. <laughs> all right. So if you have this open, if you want to follow me or not, it's all good. So let me sit down here. So I'm becoming an old man. I have to sit down now. So I want to bend down and tighten. Crazy. Okay. So now to do this, um, load up SPM. So who hasn't used SPM before? Hasn't. One. Hasn't. Okay. Hasn't. Yeah, hasn't, yeah. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so if you go into SPM, just type SPM, okay, you've got SPM 12, you click on fMRI, So if you go to preferences, you can change the colors. So it's more scientific. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the black because uh, for my eyes. I mean, I've spent so many years on a computer that I need that. So and it helps your eyesight. It'll make your eyesight not get as black bad. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, I mean, I also what I do is I, um, so it's a good point to bring up. <laughs> so the, the text, the text there, it's not white. It's like a gray color. This is for your health. Okay, this is good. So Lyndon's on board, and so Stuart, did you? Yeah, I, I, changed, I had to change. There yeah, was something I couldn't get right. So I changed it back. You changed it back? No! <laughs> okay, but I, I, I highly recommend doing this for your sanity. And then, and by yes, it has this all by fly. Okay, so. So, what SPM is, it's a tool you can do things such as pre processing. We do it like realignment, so motion correction, code distribution between like functional and local imaging. You have slice timing. Normalization, smoothing, and segmentation will be bad. That's all there in this SPM uh, toolbox. And within that, you do GLMs to find activations in the first level. and second level, you do grid analysis. Um, that's in a nutshell what SPM is and how it looks like. And so, what you do to your data, typically done, get your data, put it in, and click, 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 click until you get something. Um, of course, there's being quite rude there. I mean, you, you put, yeah, have a little time and effort to design your, your experimentals and stuff. Okay, so the way where DCM is, is this big, big button here, then it calls a modeling. Okay, so what you normally should do is you take your, your DCM to do that. You, you do the first bits, you find your activation task. Okay, so Linden has kind of done all of the other stuff. Which takes you know a long time to do. What what's happened there? So he's taken the on the scanner. <laughs> okay, he's pre-processed it. And he's a pre-pro king, I think. Um, okay, and then what he's done, you find in your data data set, pre-pro king. You like that or something else? King, because at the beginning of the session as well. Did I? No, 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 no. Ah, <laughs> she regrets it. No. <laughs> she regrets it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so what you do then, you always pre-processing, you do this, find things at the first level, and then you find activation blobs. Okay? And there where they are, you know, quite significant to the T-step map, that they correlate to your task or to a contrast. You know, hard grip and easy, um, on off. What kind of stuff? You you pick regions that come from this, okay? You get selective compare. So in this case, it was a seed based seed based functional connectivity thing because it's resting. Yeah, but yeah, so that's a good point actually. Yeah. So what? No task. Then actually did he have like a, a seed? Yeah. Uh, like let's just call it was a PCC. Uh, it was a striatum. Striatum, somewhere there. Yeah, that would do. Striatum. Yeah, he took the time series. And he found which parts are most significant to be correlated to this using a seed based analysis. And no pass and all that kind of stuff. It's very different. Can you find all regions with all regions here? Like full brain activity? Um, you probably yeah. wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, you probably <laughs> wouldn't. Just, uh, you have to do one by one by one by one by one by one. Yeah. In, normally, what we do, I guess, in the lab, we kind of do the whole thing where we parcelate this up into parcels. And then we have region. And then region and form is you know, functional connectivity matrices. Yeah, I mean like region by region. So uh, SPM doesn't do that. No. no. Not by default. I mean, you, in our toolbox and plugins, you probably can do that, but by default, and we're doing here. No. Okay, so we find these blobs, and these are our volumes of interest. So we're going to do a DCM between these, okay, these regions. We have three regions. 
and we're going to try to find out these connections okay, using the DCM framework. All right. Um, so in this in this case, Lillian has given us all these volumes of interest. So we go through go through how to actually do it. So Lyndon, if I don't do anything wrong, please come in and say, Kevin, this is wrong. Move over. I'm going to do it now. Because you're the key. Because you're the key. <laughs> That's right. So you can you press click that button. You click on specify, which means you specify your DCM. Okay. And then when you do all this stuff, you, you save it in an SPM.mat, which has all the clusters and all this sort of stuff. It's just outputs from first level, second level DCM. Done. Okay, what we call it? We'll call it workshop. No, no, no. We'll call it Linden is King. So then, what is file? Um, SPM.mat. No, and in what does it contain? So oh, the SPM.mat file I think contains the first level yeah. analysis stuff, the typical stuff you do um, in first level activation study. Is study. it done by the king or is it default? It's default. Yeah. The, uh, the sovereign do this. <laughs> <laughs> you have to see so maybe using the traditional SPM analyses. It just yeah. specifies all the stuff that SPM wants to see. To analyze through the seal buttons, if that's all. We're giving to you for free. For free. Okay. So after this, it says here select VOIs, which means select these regions. Which, when you do the first level, second level stuff, you can save VOIs. Yes? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to go back to that directory. For some reason, it's moved me somewhere else. It's probably because the there's probably a directory in the SPM that saved that's because I just copy pasted it, but it, okay. it won't matter. Okay, there we are. Good. Yeah. So it has all this information. Now I'm going to put in all of the three regions. Okay. So what is in those files? So each of these regions, each these files has the time series of each each volume, mm -hmm. has quarters of each volume, and I think that's it. Yeah, and it's the, just the first eigenvariant of the release. That's right. Yeah. Like, Basically, do the first level analyses to find the hotspots, then stick ROIs on those hotspots, and then from the data, from the process data, pull out um, to pull out the first eigenvariant as a time series of mm. that region, uh, and then those time series, those eigenvariants, are stored in the void mats. So one one dot, one void mat file per region, and you just put all mm. three of them in, uh, and that that is where the information is that the this unit modeling. So those are the time series we're now trying to. So, um, get continue parameters for. So, um, then I'm going to about the eigenvariants. So, of course, if you, have, if you have a region here, you have heaps of time and you have heaps of voxels, right? So, what you want to do is get out a thing that's common to all of them. That's why you do an eigenvariable, eigenvariable composition of this. This will have all these time series in within that region. So, you do an eigenvariant and it gives just one time signal in the end. So that's, that's, that's why how DCM works. Okay. You can't use all of these, it'll just use the eigenvariant. What does eigenvariant do? First principle component. Yeah, like a PCA. So if, if you had all of these like in the same thing, it'll look like, you know, like this. Because of course you have redundancy, because the in, in the response function you have, you have not only in time, this HRF, you have in space too. So all the regions around there will have um, similar structure. Can I make it a plus for that? Well, I can do anything I want, but like, they just use an eye invariant instead. I was wondering. You just need a summary. For EG. You just need um, a summary time series. That's right, you need a summary time. So if you have EEG, I think they also do that as well. They probably get everything in. They probably get, they probably get a source space, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then get like an ROI and get like an average time series, mm -hmm. I would say. I don't much experience the EG, the EG DCM, but I think it's probably something similar. Mm -hmm. So you have so many time series for each POI. This first level analysis is it done in SPM? Yes. With like pressing this first level button? Yeah. yeah. You Does do it involve a lot of things, a lot of clicking, or? Not really. It's quite, it's, I mean, there's, I'm not going to click it now, but you've got to specify things such as, you know, your, your filtering values, um, your experimental design, um, 
but the seeds are defined like the region, the roles basically that you're interested in are defined outside of SVM. Um, within the seed based. Well, I guess in Linden's case, in this case it was. Yeah. It was, yeah. yeah. So the, idea was, was yeah the idea is just to pick something that you're interested in and then get a time series from that and just do a general general linear model with that on all the boxes and mm -hmm. rest of the brain to just ask the question, you know, how does the activity in this region I'm interested in co vary or correlate with the rest of the brain? And then you find the regions that it does and then you get the time series from those regions and then we're modeling those mm -hmm. time series. That's right, yeah. So a bit of stuff could go into I mean there's a lot of really good tutorials on this if you're really interested in this. Um, and I would say it it won't take you very long to, to do it. Um, it's a bit of clicking, but it's all this stuff is well documented and um, quite robust as well. Um, okay, cool. I think we're going to put the eye very we didn't touch that at all. Because we don't want to model every single box, because that would be too many. Right? We just want to model uh, like a summary of each of these regions. Okay, got that? Cool. So we set the BOIs and done. Uh, uh, BOI timings. Yep. This is the TR, I guess. Uh, not quite. It's half the TR. Half. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So anti quick done. Mm. And then just so why is it half the TR? Uh, I can't remember. It's in the documentation somewhere. Okay. Um, okay. I can't remember. What is TR? Uh, the acquisition time. Acquisition time. How how much mm -hmm. passing? So this does 2.5 seconds between volumes. Are you aware of whether um, DCM is only um, available in SPM? Is it available in FSL? As far as I know, available in FSL. No, I mean, you can import stuff from FSL into here. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, so do you, you have all your data in FSL that we have? Um, Reprocessed? No, it's just because I'm much more familiar with FSL than SPM. So I was just kind of wondering. Well, I think if you have everything in FSL, if you go over everything actually um, uh, pre processed and you're happy with that, the step to click on these is actually quite easy. Mm -hmm. So you can, I, I actually do this sometimes, I do everything, all the pre processing, I start with SPM and then only bring it into the first level analysis. So mm -hmm. you can easily do that. You can jump in at that point and avoid all these other steps. Okay. Yeah. Um, using does that, so you can, you can definitely do that. Okay, cool. Enter. Echo time is, I guess, it's all saved from your. Yeah, yeah. So the these are the Yeah, this is from the actual acquisitions. So yeah, you, so change, you can leave it all as is for now, but you'd have to change it if you had different color. Okay, monetary effects now. We don't have any mod modulatory effects because it's the uh, Christian Safe DCM. So you click anything here, yeah, but we just click apply and just for default states per region. We'll do, we'll do a one state DCM. Yeah, one state. What does that mean, state per region? So um, you know in DCM how we had this bilinear model. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite a bit longer there. What's that? We're not, we're not there yet. You skipped ahead. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very simple model for DCM. So you have this with the DCM you had like between these two regions here. Uh -huh. In two states you can have between each region you can have this sort of extra state. And then that goes out to there. So we're, we're dealing with one state. Everything's out before and it's actually just one state. Okay. Um, is two state used a lot for resting state DCM? Uh, I, probably, I probably think not, that if you if you find out in the literature later that it's it's you know used a lot, please tell me. Stochastic effects I mean, you click yes or no, what do you normally do for this one? Uh, matter too much. No, you click no because if you do, I think it will probably default to a stochastic DCM if you do that. Yeah. It'll take a long time. We don't want it to send to the import. Um, my, my screen just jumps straight into the endogenous fixation. Yeah, mine too. Um, without that. It's it's without it's that model, model. Without which DC, which yeah. SPM are you using? Could be, you have a different tool. Well. Yeah, like a different. Yeah. You could have a different revision. Like they could just be precise. Like okay. Um, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Mine's like six six eight five. Oh yeah, mine's six nine oh six. 
That's okay. If you're using it's it on massive cool. and you just use the default SPM12 on massive, that's probably out of date. And whereas Kevin's proper and Stuart presumably has downloaded it straight from the SPM website. Yeah. And he's running it locally. Um, so, yeah. So, don't worry too much about it. We're going to be picking some defaults in the background, probably. Yeah. Uh, so, for this one here, this we're doing cross petrol density. CFD, if you have that, it should be there somewhere. Yeah. And he then defined the, Ooh, so you went, you went to this one, the yeah, did you? Mm -hmm. this one here. Yeah. So here you specify all different regions of the connections you put up. So we're going to now specify, to start for everything, um, a fully connected network. Where all these connections are connected to one another. So which is A, B, and C. So this is the, what's tri stri what is that? The stri so that's, the, yeah, so that's the tri stri is the name of one of my parcelations, and it's just the second region, so underscore two. Okay. Yeah, dorsal. dorsal. Okay, so dorsal stratum. And this is the dorsal electric front of the cortex? Yep, on the left hand. And this is the anterior segment? Yep. Yeah. Cool. But these three regions are defined in the connections. So the A matrix, we're going to put in the, the default input. So you can turn some of these things off as well if you want to. And you click done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay, I think the the, error, the messages here in the, in the SPM isn't as funny or aren't as funny as ever. So to be honest, so what really cool works. Okay, so then what you do after you specify, you then estimate cross vectra. Click on that one. You go back to the Yeah, you click back on the VCM again. Yeah. Right. Then you go action. Estimate cross vectra. Estimate cross vectra. Right. Once you click that. You will see, oops, we're going to use Linen is King. <laughs> He's loving that. <laughs> loving that. Okay, click on that one. And then done. And then here we are. It's estimating it. So as you can see, this is the, the real. All the different cost spectrum densities, some of that stuff we had before from A and B, all kind of stuff. Now it's trying to fit that. So it's, it's trying to fit the real part and also the imaginary part there. And the different lines are. So the different the lines. Connection. That's yeah. right. So we had before we had that cross density. We had that idea where you had. Um, so we talk about this one here. We can talk about like our F. That one there. Cross spectral density. That's what we're doing. Each of these are the two different ones, and the real and the imaginary part. So we're just trying to estimate that. So we haven't got it all about how this is estimated, um, and I think the main part which I want to get through everyone is how to actually do this in terms of of the dynamic spin. You can look up this. This is all based on this sort of Laplace uh, Bayesian framework, um, which is requires a whole bunch of reading and stuff. But it's we can just take it as unbuilding as there is estimate. It's actually quite robust. Okay, so now we've actually fitted the data. And we have also an accuracy in the bottom one here, which I think we're through next week. What about uh, that, that part that is in the real one but doesn't capture at the end of the Yeah, so this is, just can't capture these additional parts. Maybe you might need an additional region to capture the extra part because I guess the more Reasons the more repertoire, the more dynamics you have. You might have to have to have, to have more parameters, or in this case, more regions to capture that. Okay, and that's it. <laughs> As I said before, just clicking. I mean, I was went slow in the clicking, but this is like five hours worth of lecture, or like kind of talks and things. What it comes down to. Maybe and bring up the A matrix and show people that. Yeah, definitely. So if I go into the DCM, click onto this, click on review, I can go back to the King. Done. And he can review different parts. So here you can review the time series data. So here are all the eigenvariants and how they look like. I don't know why it's so big. I can't really size these yeah, either. SPM scales badly sometimes. Hold on, let me just make this uh, scale. Let's make it. Oh, I 
address. So you can see here, here's the res uh, all responses with different, uh, these are all the eigenvariants we use with these here. Yeah. So the time series we started with. Okay. Um, other things we can look at, we can look at coupling matrix A. And this gives you the, oh, that scales terribly. What the hell's going on? I think it's just because I screwed up with the screen. It was rude. Just to give you the A matrix and all these values. And the probability of these ones are actually real. Hard to see that. It's yeah. really bad scaling. It's not great, but like the smaller scaling. I think you might need to start with a bigger screen. Oh, sorry about that. You might, if you go on massiveness, I think it's probably better on your big screens. And also the strength of these connections, of these fixed effects. These um, okay, I'll do other things such as look at the inputs. We have no inputs. Our C matrix is zero. Yep, that makes sense. And we have the transfer functions. Remember I talk about transfer functions? Here are the, the analytic ones here. How do you go from region 1 to region 2? How they all look like? Um, you can also look at the cross spectrum as well, at different regions, so that like the different uh, curves, what they look like. So that should fit it quite well in this particular one here. This is the uh, real and the, sorry, the data and the model. But we don't seem to fix these parts here. Uh, we can look at the uh, cross spectrum neural. These are the, the neural cross spectrums from the bilinear model. So before they go into a, a, the balloon model and everything like that. And then we can also look at the convolution kernels. So all the cross trans functions in um, convolution space. And then we can also look at where the regions are. It's quite a quite cool little thing there. So we've gone from all that, we've gone from how, how to model this. Can we understand these models and how they will work? We understand what the parameters mean. Can we understand what, what these things do in the background in terms of the modeling components? Uh, and we've gone from, we've actually done DCM together. As you can see here, that this took seconds, right? I mean, this used to take a long, long time without special VCM. So for every different kinds of connections, you do this over and over again? Or is there a way to specify the possible connections you want to test? I think you can do that uh, in, a, in the batch setting. So if you click on this, uh, the batch, and then you can probably add here SPM, DCM, Specification. And, uh, input specification. Yeah, you put all this stuff together. You can make it a batch file. Okay. You can just save it. All that kind of stuff. Which is quite good. It has a, this this batch thing is like relatively new for SPM, but it's quite quite cool. It makes it a little script for it that you can run. Um, that's I guess we run a DCM together. We kind of hit like the. I think most of the parts I want to convey in these workshops, what modeling is, <laughs> what the data is, and applying DCM. So we haven't got into the other parts in terms of um, kind of the best model to choose using beta using model selection and doing this on a group level. So next, the next uh, actually will be next week on Thursday at 3 p.m. We can't do Wednesday next week. Mm -hmm. We'll go through those co concepts of basic model selection. We'll do that, do that as well together um, and talk a little bit about you know, issues on, on group analysis. And then Linda might get up here and talk as well. So, um, or Linda will, I should say. Not mine, <laughs> will. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's that's it for today. Um, it's 4.44. OK, I said it wasn't going to go that long that I did. Sorry about that. But hopefully that was useful. Um, stop. Okay. Hopefully not too bored by all this now. And I think we got to the point where we actually did it together.
which is cool. 